Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, June 15th, 2015. Here are top stories. Tonight, riding migrants attempt to hijack trucks heading for the UK. Then, Prime Minister David Cameron flubs the Magna Carta. And a hard look at Jade Helm 15. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. So see, they're lying to us. Their own Jade Helm handout says the things we've said, and then they tell the media it doesn't exist. It was 800 years ago today that King John was forced to sign the Magna Carta. Now, of course, that is really the Magna Carta Libertatum, the big charter of liberty. Today, we have a lot of big charters being put before us, big charters of tyranny. I guess you could call them the Magna Carta Tyrannis, or whatever the Latin is. It was a situation 800 years ago like we're seeing today. Arbitrary use of power, massive increase in taxes. And so the people came to King John and they established this charter. Now, the BBC asks, what is the big deal about the Magna Carta? It is a big deal in America, even a bigger deal in America than it is in the UK, because we have utilized it as our founding document. It has set a pattern establishing the rule of law as being above those who are our leaders, that has resulted in a document that is itself the king. The colonists called it Lex Rex. That's what the Constitution is fundamentally about. Now, in this article from the BBC, they point out that even the door of the U.S. Supreme Court shows King John of England being coerced by the barons to place his seal on the Magna Carta. Now, they point out, and as I said before, it's bigger in Eng here than it is in England. They say only three of the clauses are still in effect in England, but we have in the U.S. 17 out of the 50 states refer to the Magna Carta on their statute books. That's why Americans hold this so dearly. It established the rule of law. It established the rule of law over the king. It established what was legitimate authority. Now, we have an article up on Infowars.com today. David Cameron was clueless on the Magna Carta when he was questioned by David Letterman a couple of years ago in 2012. Uh, David Letterman asked him some questions about it. Of course, he knew where it was signed, or I should say sealed, because the king didn't actually sign it. He just stamped it with his seal. He knew where it was sealed. He knew when it was sealed, but he didn't even know what Magna Carta meant. He didn't even know that it meant Big Charter, let alone the liberty part of it. So it's kind of puzzling that he would hold up today that they're going to have a British uh, Bill of Rights that is going to supersede the human rights coming out of the European Union. He says that they need to have local rule, and I agree with that. But when he doesn't understand what the document is about, when they have not produced a British Bill of Rights, it makes you question what their commitment is to the Bill of Rights, especially when we look at the way they have treated privacy and the rule of law and due process in that country, as they have in America as well. Now, there's an article on World Net Daily. Bill Federer points out uh, what the parallels are to the Magna Carta and our Constitution. And of course, it's not just the fact that we are establishing that the rule of law is preeminent, preeminent even over the leaders of the country, but there's a lot of parallels. It's also the source for much of our Bill of Rights of our Constitution. For example, he says in the 12th clause, no tax shall be imposed in the kingdom. This is from the original document, unless by common counsel of our kingdom is reflected in the revolutionary phrase, no taxation without representation and that the government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. In addition to that, they say a free man shall be fined only in proportion to the degree of his offense. We have excessive bail will not be required. That's in the Bill of Rights. In the original Magna Carta, it says, no constable or other bailiff shall take corn or other provisions from anyone without immediately tendering money. It says, we have now, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Of course, that's recently been overturned, hasn't it? And Kello at the uh, Supreme Court, we've also seen eminent domain being overturned in the Keystone Pipeline case. We now have given the power not only to a private corporation to take someone else's private property for private use, we have now extrapolated that to multinational corporations, giving TransCanada, the runner of the Keystone Pipeline, the capability to come in and condemn property to take it by eminent domain from family farms, many of whom have had those farms for hundreds of years. 
One more here. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or deprived of his standing in any other way, nor will we proceed without force against him except by lawful judgment of his equals. And again, that's from the Magna Carta. We have that you will have a due process, of course, under the uh, 14th Amendment. There's also parallels with the First Amendment as well. The English church shall be free and shall have rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. That's the First Amendment, which is freedom of religion. It's not freedom from religion. It is a wall of separation that protects the uh, religious practices of people from incursion by the state. In another article at Infowars.com, Magna Carta at 800, a promise unfulfilled. Yes, it is definitely unfulfilled. And this is an interview uh, Real News Network did with Michael Ratner, president uh, for the Center for Constitutional Rights. And he points out what Frederick Douglass, a slave, said. And if you remember, of course, uh, when we had the Magna Carta, this was essentially establishing the rights only for those noblemen. It didn't really affect the common man. That expanded over the centuries until by the time our country was founded, it affected all free people, but it did not affect slaves. And that was the point that Frederick Douglass made in the 1850s, who was asked to address a 4th of July celebration. And he said, people in the United States were still enslaved at that point. He said, millions of slaves. What does this say about it? He said, your 4th of July is a sham. Your boasted liberty is an unholy license for enslaving blacks. Your shouts of liberty and equality are a hollow mockery. Now, Ratner says, we could say the same thing today. We could say, when we look at the people that have been tortured, who remain imprisoned at Guantanamo, the two million that are imprisoned in the United States, how does the land of the free have the greatest number of people in prison? By far, the highest percentage of any country in prison. Yes, the land of the free. Murdered by drones, murdered by police, killed in unlawful wars, yes, the Magna Carta, and our Constitution have become a sham. That doesn't mean that we ignored them. They are still a guideline. They are still a template for where we need to be. What it does is it exposes the criminal actions of our current leaders who are in every way as bad as King John was. And he points out that there was another aspect of this time, something that uh, most people are not talking about. When we look at the Magna Carta, as we began the program, we showed that it was on the door of the Supreme Court, the signing at Runnymede. But there was something else that happened at that time as well. Certainly the Magna Carta laid out judicial principles, civil liberties principles, but there were also economic issues as well. Everyone knows the story of Robin Hood, how they were prohibited from taking any game or any lumber off of the king's land because he asserted ownership over everything. Doesn't that sound familiar today? As I said at the beginning, we are looking at a charter of tyranny that is being expressed worldwide in these global trade agreements, the transatlantic, the transpacific partnerships that are going to be greased through without going through the due process that is required in the Constitution for passing these treaties. Those treaties are set up to return to the kind of feudalism that we saw before the Magna Carta, where the king, actually in this case, it's going to be corporate barons will assert ownership over everything. Now, Ratner pointed out it in this um, commentary that at the time the Magna Carta was signed, there was also another bill that was very important for economic rights, and that was the Treaty of the Forest, the Charter of the Forest. It proclaimed at roughly the same time economic rights. He said they were then given the right to chop wood. They were able to use that wood to build their homes. They were able to take part of the forest as against the king who at one time claimed all of that forest. They were allowed to take honey out of the forest. They were allowed to have rights of economic survival. That's where we need to be today. And that's precisely what these transatlantic, transpacific partnerships that they have created are designed to take away. They're designed to hand over ownership, whether it's perpetual copyright over drugs or perpetual copyright over songs or movies. They want to have copyright ownership over everything, even your truck, as we pointed out in many times. Your John Deere tractor, your personal vehicle, they assume that you are going to be merely leasing that vehicle from them because they own the copyright to the software that monitors and controls the engine. That's where they want to go. We have to understand that. And we have to understand where we need to go. Wise and just men have laid out the pattern for where we need to return to. 
and we need to take it in that direction. It's an opposite direction from where we're going. One last point that he makes. He says the American Bar Association erected a, uh, a statue there at Runnymede, and the motto on it says, Freedom Under the Law. And he points out that the Magna Carta and the, was a struggle of the barons against the authority of the king. He says it was against authority. He says, so what this monument there should have said was authority under law. In other words, our authorities, our police, our homeland security, our FBI, our president, our Department of Justice are under the law themselves, as well as all of these bureaucracies. That is really the kind of charter that we need to have. Now, one of the things we need to remember, it was not uh, the right to keep and bear arms was not part of the Magna Carta. It is part of our recognized fundamental rights, but we see in the Magna Carta that that was how they established their liberties, was through the force of arms. It was really only buying time when King John put his seal to it, because within three months, he had gone back to war with the noblemen. And that would have turned into a uh, very violent civil war, probably with France taking over the country, if he hadn't died quickly and his son, who was nine years old, succeeded him. That consolidated the country, and it also consolidated the uh, Charter of Liberties. But when we look at the Second Amendment today, that is what establishes and holds the rest of our liberties. We see uh, from New American that a federal judge has tossed out the Brady campaign lawsuit over Kansas's Second Amendment law. Now, what did the Brady campaign find to be offensive in this Kansas law? Well, they say, the law said, any act, treaty, order, rule, or regulation by the government of the United States which violates the Second Amendment of the United States is null, void, and unenforceable in the state of Kansas. Hmm. So that's what they objected to, that any regulation by our government or any treaty that they might sign, like the UN Arms Trade Treaty or these Trans-Pacific, Transatlantic Partnerships, which are really treaties, that's the fundamental lie underlying them. If they sign any kind of regulation, pass any kind of law, the preeminent law of the land, the king of the land, the king that every one of them swears allegiance to as condition of taking their office. Lex Rex, the supreme law of the land, is the Constitution. And that's what the Brady Bill has a problem with. Now, the Brady Group, I should say, of course, they did get the Brady Bill passed. Uh, it was some time after Press Secretary, Ronald Reagan's Press Secretary uh, Brady was shot. We just see this uh, article coming out of the Daily Mail. The president, Ronald Reagan, always carried a pistol with him. How about that? That's outlawed in Washington, D.C. Uh, I guess uh, they wouldn't dare go after him, but he says... Uh, this is a writer, Brad Meltzer, who is uh, doing research for a book called The President's Shadow. He talked to Secret Service agents, and they told him that President Reagan always carried a gun with him at all times. He carried it in his briefcase. He never left the White House without it. It was a 38 caliber pistol. He even took it on Air Force One. Well, that's right, because, you know, he was within his rights. I'm sure that uh, if he'd been someone of lesser stature, and uh, they had found that. They would uh, go after him, as we've seen many times, with their draconian legislation. Of course, they allow uh, TV anchors and journalists to violate their laws live on air. But other people who even have non-functioning, empty, spent shotgun shells have seen the wrath of the D.C. lawyers. One of the things they said in this that I thought was kind of interesting, they said Reagan was the first uh, president in office to survive an assassination attempt. Actually, no, he wasn't. Uh, in 1835, Andrew Jackson was uh, the, the, someone who attempted to shoot him as he was leaving the Capitol. The, guy, the gun misfired. Uh, Andrew Jackson started fighting with him. Uh, he pulled out a second pistol, and uh, that second Derringer also misfired, at which point uh, he was subdued and taken away. A hundred years later, they say, uh, the Smithsonian took these Derringers out, and they both fired immediately the first try. So what are the chances of that happening that they would not fire? Well, somebody calculated that and said it was 1 in 125,000. Maybe we've seen God's providence the first time and taking down the second bank of the United States because it was this assassination attempt happened one year before the charter was to expire. And of course, Andrew Jackson, one of the key things that he was fighting was the bankers. He was going to take down that national bank, that central bank 
in the United States. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's happening with the bankers in Greece. It looks like uh, this Trojan horse is about ready to disgouge all of the lawyers by night. So stay with us. We're going to talk about what is about to break in Europe. We'll be right back. Now, this last week, as the key players in the world's largest banks, key political leaders, the IMF fund, as they were meeting secretly in Austria, the Bilderberg Group, we had the Greek economic crisis coming to even more of a head. Looks like they have reached an impasse, at least for now, for the foreseeable future. Markets are reacting, and Greece creditors are digging in after the debt talks founder. This is a report from Reuters that says uh, Greece and its creditors hardened their stances on Monday after the collapse of talks aimed at preventing a default and possible euro exit, prompting Germany's EU commissioner to say the time had come to prepare for a, quote, state of emergency, unquote. Now, the prime minister of Greece, Alexis Tsipras, said that he blamed creditors. And it's interesting because we see the leaders of the other European countries putting pressure on Greece because it wouldn't look that good if it was coming directly from the banks. Nevertheless, this is coming from the banks. And the Greeks are not being fooled by this. Of course, they had the story of the Trojan horse. They know precisely what this is about. Of course, the way the Trojan horse comes to us today is packaged as a welfare state. That's the way the IMF set up the third world decades ago. Once Robert McNamara became head of the IMF, they went from a situation that was similar to the Marshall Plan in Europe, where they helped people to improve their infrastructure, improve their manufacturing capacity, improve their income generation, their standard of living. Instead, they made a change under Robert McNamara. What they decided they would do was to encourage the developing countries to not develop, but to rather create a welfare state. By giving them loans for a welfare state, McNamara was accused of rent-seeking. In other words, creating a situation where these people would never be wealthy enough to ever get out of debt to the bankers. And that is precisely what we see happening in Europe as well. That is the Trojan horse of the 21st century. Now, this is what they had to say. They said, no more new proposals. Take it or leave it. Time is upon us, I think, or very close to it, said one euro official. Now, the Greek prime minister, Cyprus, blamed, quote, political expediency, unquote, on the part of the lenders for the impasse and their insistence on new cuts in pensions. And he says this is after five years of looting under the bailouts. And they say it's primarily coming from three institutions, the European Commission, the IMF, and the European Central Bank. They are the ones who are putting the pressure on the politicians. And then it appears as if this is pressure, a struggle between Germany and Greece. No, it is really the bankers who are behind all of this, the same people that we just saw meeting at the Bilderberg conference. Now, the Greeks, on the other hand, are demanding an end to the creditor looting, they say, after the talks break down. They say they're fed up with years of austerity. Athens has balked at demands to raise taxes and cut pensions in order to narrow its fiscal deficit. And of course, if they don't do that, then the bankers want to just take over the country, take it bit by bit, because that is the end game. The end goal is for them to own everything. They're not content necessarily just to have us uh, renting from them constantly, going further and further into debt. At one point, they're going to want to take possession of our countries fiscally and take the resources as well. In lieu of that, we see that the Greeks also see what is coming down the line. It's something that's going to be coming down the line for us as well if we don't get out of this endless cycle of increasing debt to the central bankers. Greek banks are now seeing a deposit outflow of $449 million just today. They're saying that people have uh, these, these talks back and forth between the IMF fund and the government have fed uncertainty and fears that capital controls will be introduced. Now, that's basically just saying that they're not going to let you take your money out of the bank, or they will take it out for you as a haircut. Just take their uh, resources straight out. And of course, the effect this is having is that uh, stocks are falling around the world. Uh, around the world on Monday, they felt the ripple effect of the Greek crisis. Losses were broad across risky assets, such as equities, throughout major stock in indexes for the lows of the session. They say, however, that gold and silver did rise. Now, as we see this play out, and as we see them try to uh, tighten the noose around Greece, we know where this is heading for us. And we have to ask, 
do we really want to have a closer tie-in with this European Union as they are experiencing these financial difficulties? Is that really something we want to be more tightly integrated with? Do we want to have a political and economic union? That's precisely what this is. Senator Sessions has seen these agreements, and he says that's precisely what they're doing. Now, in order to do that, we've got a couple of different ways that uh, Boehner and the GOP leadership, a couple of carrots that they're offering to people. One of them is to say that they are going to extend welfare benefits to people who lose their jobs. Really? Does that make you feel better? Would you rather have your job, or would you rather have some temporary welfare benefits that will be removed in a few years? Now, that was the issue, the TAA, and we have a report from John Bound coming up about that. But, of course, that was voted down last week. Now the GOP has a different strategy that they're offering. In this particular one, they're going to raise taxes on small businesses to help to pay for the unemployment benefits of the people who are going to lose their jobs. You see how it works out? American workers lose, American small business loses, but the big multinational corporations and the banks are big winners, and they're the ones who are writing the laws in secret. They're the ones who are writing this treaty in secret, and quite frankly, John Boehner shouldn't even be involved in a treaty. They should require two-thirds of the Senate to vote for this, but of course, that's what the TPA, the fast track, is all about. It's about changing the rules so they can slide this thing through in a way that they could not get it through if it was if they were to follow the rules. Now they point out that the TAA was originally supposed to be financed with Medicare cuts. Well, that got pushed back. So now what they're going to do is they're going to uh, possibly as soon as tomorrow have a vote on Obama trade. That's on Tuesday. A vote to give the IRS more power and more incentive incentives to go after small business. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to put out uh, a, essentially a bounty on small businesses to make sure that they dot every I, cross every T on their 1099 forms. And if they don't, they are tripling and quintupling the penalties on this. They are basically going to try to put out small business because, you know, the large companies, uh, it's kind of like a bumblebee going through a spider web. It doesn't catch the big guys. It only catches the small flies. And that's what they're going to be coming after with these taxes. John Bown has more about the TAA, yet another acronym. Alabama Senator Jeff Sessions warns there will be another attempt in Congress on Tuesday to push through TAA and fast track authority. If that happens, it will empower the president to form a Pacific Union encompassing 40% of the world's economy in 12 nations, each with one equal vote. Once the union is formed, foreign bureaucrats will be required to meet regularly to write the commission's rules, regulations, and directives, impacting American jobs, wages, and sovereignty, Session said in a statement posted on his Senate webpage. The Trade Adjustment Assistance, or the TAA, would allegedly protect workers from the consequences of the TPA fast track. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and House Speaker John Boehner crafted TAA as a compromise to nudge Democrats who fear a backlash from constituents. TAA, however, would not protect workers as transnational corporations continue to pillage industries and move jobs offshore under TPA and fast track. Sessions writes, Fast Track will not only apply to the Pacific Union, but can expedite an unlimited number of yet unseen international compacts for six years. There are already plans to advance through Fast Track, the Trade-In Services Agreement, the goal of which includes labor mobility among more than 50 nations, further eroding the ability of the American people to control their own affairs. The globalists are using trade deficits and labor mobility to further reduce wages of American workers. TPA would extend and increase the corrosive effect of job losses begun under NAFTA. Between 1979 and 1994, trade eliminated 2.4 million jobs in the U.S., wrote Robert E. Scott, an economist for the Economic Policy Institute, in 1998. Growing trade deficits were responsible for most of these job losses, which were concentrated in manufacturing because most trade involves the sale of manufactured goods. NAFTA added to the flow of jobs out of the U.S. by encouraging firms to move production to Mexico and Canada. Our trade deficit with both countries increased from $16 billion in 1993 to $48 billion in 1996 in constant 1987 dollars. The U.S. lost 395,000 jobs as a result of the NAFTA deficits. 
Japan and Mexico eventually lost manufacturing to China. In 2013, the overall U.S. trade deficit with China expanded to $315 billion. That big drain tends to slow U.S. economic growth at a time when our government debt is huge and unemployment is high. Establishment economists routinely state globalist free trade is healthy for the economy and creates domestic jobs. Former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for the Reagan administration, Paul Craig Roberts, wrote, the claim that jobs offshoring by U.S. corporations increases domestic employment in the U.S. is one of the greatest hoaxes ever perpetrated. Over the last decade, the net new jobs created in the U.S. have nothing to do with the multinational corporations. The jobs consist of waitresses and bartenders, healthcare and social services, retail clerks, and while the bubble lasted, construction. These are not the high-tech, high-paying jobs that the new economy promised and they are not the jobs that can be associated with global corporations. Moreover, these domestic service jobs are themselves scarce, Sessions writes. While elites dream of a world without borders, voters dream of a world where the politicians they elect put this country's own citizens first. The movement among Americans toward a decent, honest populism, toward a refocusing on the needs of American citizens and American interests, grows stronger by the day. Every vote to come before Congress, beginning with the next fast-track push, will face this test. Does your plan strengthen or weaken the social and economic position of the loyal, everyday working American? John Bound for Infowars.com. Yes, of course, that is the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program, the TAA. No, it's really just welfare benefits. We're going to be exporting jobs then creating a new welfare program and paying for that by raising taxes on small business. That's the GOP plan. What are the Democrats going to do? Well, Pelosi says we need to slow down fast track. We need to get a better deal for the American people. No, we need to stop fast track. We need to stop this unconstitutional process on this treaty right now. And we don't need to hold out for a better deal for the American people. She's holding out for a better deal for American politicians. They want to get a little bit more payback before they're going to sign on to this thing. And believe me, they will sign on to it once they get their paycheck. I guess uh, Boehner didn't hand those out on the floor before the vote like he did with the tobacco lobbyist uh, back in the 90s. Now, if we look at this video that uh, we have today on Infowars.com, a shock video of rioting immigrants in the UK who are trying to hijack trucks that are headed into the UK. They're in Calais, France, about to cross the channel. And if you look at this video there, it's total anarchy, chaos, this is a balkanization strategy. If you remember at the beginning of the program, we were talking about how this is a trap for the Greek economy, how they are essentially coming after them, taking their pensions, uh, killing their pensions, raising their taxes. And of course, people are seeing this as a competition between rich states like Germany and the poor states like Greece who have a welfare system that is out of control. Let me explain to you that the way things are happening right now in Europe, and of course this is being pushed by the banks, there's going to be an out of control welfare state in every one of the European countries. As Paul Joseph Watson reports, this is shocking footage that's filmed at the French port town of Calais. It shows desperate migrants attempting to break into delivery trucks headed to the UK, and another illustration of how the country's generous welfare system acts as a beacon for illegal aliens. And of course, who's behind this? It's the bankers. Paul Watson points out, Goldman Sachs chairman and UN special representative for migration, Peter Sutherland, said yesterday that Britain should take more migrants in order to avoid creating an environment of xenophobia and racism. That's right. If you don't drive your country into economic collapse with a Cloward and Piven strategy, with the IMF's strategy, came out about the same time that Cloward and Piven came out with their strategy. We had McNamara at the IMF say that uh, they're gonna put people on rent-seeking status, increase the welfare state to the point that they will never get off of it. And of course, if you object to that strategy of the bankers bankrupting your country, taking control of everything, you are xenophobic and you are racist. But take a look at this article from Reuters, migrants race through Italy to dodge EU asylum rules. And they point out that last month, 
One particular individual that they're talking about rescued with hundreds of other migrants in the Mediterranean Sea was brought into Sicily. This 24-year-old, instead of applying for refugee status in Sicily or Italy, where he landed, as European law dictates, instead he made his way to just south of the Austrian border, and he hopes to cross into Austria, travel through Germany to Sweden, where his brother now lives. So you see, when we look at the situation that we have in Greece, and they're saying, well, you know, Greece has this untenable situation with their welfare state. Uh, Germany has uh, managed theirs better. It's not going to happen that much longer. As they point out, in 2014, 625,000 people sought asylum in the European Union. Just under a third of those, 200,000 applied in Germany alone, while Sweden received 81,000 applications, the highest number as a proportion of population. In other words, Sweden has about a tenth of the population of Germany so they would have, if you scale that up, that would be equivalent to about uh, 800,000 immigrants instead of 200,000 for Germany. See, they're going to where the welfare state is the best. They're going to the richest countries, and they're going to the countries like Sweden that has the most advanced socialist welfare state. They're not refugees. They are seeking to live off of other people, and they're being encouraged by these bankers, this Goldman Sachs uh, banker, the UN representative on migration, saying, if you don't support that, if you don't support the collapse of your country, then you are racist and xenophobic. Stay with us when we come back. We're going to take a look at Jade Helm, and this is a deeper look than you've probably seen before. What is really behind this exercise? Stay with us. We'll be right back. So what do you say about the influence? I mean, there's very powerful people there. Why does it have to be so secret? I mean, there is no secrecy. It's uh, there is absolutely. No as I talked to the hotel it's, guys. It's just a private meeting. If you want to know the evils lurking within the Bilderberg Group, look no further than the following quotes from Bilderberg insiders and those who've studied the secretive cabal. Bill Gates. So you've got a thing on the left, CO2, that you want to get to zero. And that's going to be based on the number of people, the services each person's using on average, the energy on average for each service, and the CO2 being put out uh, per unit of energy. Probably one of these numbers is going to have to get pretty near to zero. Uh, that's back from high school algebra. But let's, let's take a look. Dr. Henry Kissinger at the 1992 Bilderberg meeting at Evian's France Today, America would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order, referring to the 1991 LA riots. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told that there were an outside threat from beyond, i.e. an extraterrestrial invasion, whether real or promulgated, that threatened our very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will plead to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by the world government. David Rockefeller wrote in his book Memoirs, If the Council on Foreign Relations raises the hackles of the conspiracy theorists, the Bilderberg meetings must induce apocalyptic visions of omnipotent international bankers plotting with unscrupulous government officials to impose cunning schemes on an ignorant and unsuspecting world. At the 1991 Bilderberg meeting at Badan, Germany, a meeting also attended by Bill Clinton, David Rockefeller said, We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But the world is more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. And David Rockefeller from his book Memoirs again, some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Already we've seen leading members of Congress used to always attend the Speaker of the House, uh, representatives, ranking senators uh, would attend. Now they don't dare because they get mail from their own constituents. 
their own, uh, voters in their own congressional district are in their st home state for the senators, saying if you uh, do business with uh, these criminals in anymore, we'll never vote for you again. We'll vote for anybody else. And they've been politically frightened out of the ballgame. 19th century politician and historian Lord Acton said the issue which has swept down the centuries and which will have to be fought sooner or later is the people versus the banks. The ruthless and cunning behavior of the attendees of the Bilderberg Conference can be summed up in the Machiavelli quote, men are so simple and so much inclined to obey immediate needs that a deceiver will never lack victims for his deceptions. We can see the ripples of secrecy in the Bilderberg Group and that of President Obama's TPP and Adam Weishaupt, founder of the Illuminati's quote, the great strength of our order lies in its concealment. Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always concealed by another name and another occupation. Baron Nathan Mayor Rothschild said, I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British Empire, and I control the money supply. And if those quotes aren't creepy enough for you, David Spangler of the United Nations Directory of the Planetary Initiative said, No one will enter the New World Order unless he or she will make a pledge to worship Lucifer. No one will enter the New Age unless he will take a Luciferian initiation. And it's not as if we have not been warned time and time again. Congressman Lewis T. McFadden in 1932 said, We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board. This evil institution has impoverished the people of the United States and has practically bankrupted our government. It has done this through the corrupt practices of the moneyed vultures who control it. Woodrow Wilson, who signed the Federal Reserve into existence, said, I am a most unhappy man. I've unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are in the hands of a few men. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, there was a headline this weekend on the Sunday Times, the London Sunday Times, German tanks rolling back into Poland. That sounds pretty provocative, doesn't it? But actually, it's just Operation Noble Jump. It's just an exercise. This will be about 2,000 troops from several different countries. Compare that to Operation Jade Helm, where we have 1,200 troops in Texas alone. All the branches of special forces are going to be involved in Jade Helm. And of course, as they point out with Operation Noble Jump in Europe, this is in response to an increasingly expansionist Russia. That's what the Sunday Times says. Look, we always have these exercises in response to something. They're always there to prepare for a threat, and they're there to send a message. Well, clearly we can see what the situation is in Europe. We see they're preparing for this threat, we're told, that's coming from Russia. Never mind what George Soros and Victoria Nuland and others in the State Department did to create the situation in Ukraine. No, we're there to prepare for that threat and also to send a message to the Russians. So it asks, begs the question, what's going on in America? What is the threat that they're responding to? What message are they trying to send? Of course, they always prepare where and how they're going to fight. And so when we look at the logo, Mastering the Human Domain, and we look at the fact that uh, Admiral McRaven, who was a former commander of Special Forces, said, building understanding of the human domain requires boots on the ground, feeding information into the network. Geospatial intelligence is primarily biometric intelligence. It has a very long and troubling history. Jade Helm 15 a military exercise of grand scale. The military claims the exercise is for overseas training, yet three of these United States have been listed as hostile. The term mastering the human domain reveals to us that Jade Helm 15 is more than just a military exercise. It's also an exercise of the new field of geospatial intelligence, using human domain analytics to map the politics and thoughts of any nation, state, city, right down to the individual. Jade Helm 15, that's what the United States Army is calling a large-scale military exercise. Special Operations Command will be training with other armed units beginning in July. 
In a recent InfoWars.com report, Master the Human Domain, the domestic plan behind Jade Helm, we break down what the Jade Helm logo refers to. In brief, a new discipline in intelligence has been at center stage for the past decade, Activity-Based Intelligence, or ABI. According to TrajectoryMagazine.com, the human domain, or human dimension, which is a vital and integral part of ABI, is defined as the presence activities including transactions both physical and virtual, culture, social structure, organization, networks and relationships, motivations, intent, vulnerabilities, and capabilities of humans, single or groups, across all domains of the operational environment, space, air, maritime, ground, and cyber. This article goes on to say that the focus on mastering the human domain was born out of a merging of three already existing disciplines of intelligence. That may be the case for this branding of this idea, but the exercise of mapping the human domain right down to the individual is a long-standing institutionalized strategy that has been going on for well over 100 years. What reason would the United States government have to invest so much time, resources, and money in order to pinpoint exact pockets of thought in a country founded on free thought, expression, and most of all, outspoken words against its own government? During his famous farewell address, Eisenhower warned the American people of an imminent and internal threat, a scientific elite. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. The title, Scientific Elite, to most Americans might seem like nothing more than ordinary intangible rhetoric typically thrown around by politicians during their speeches. This time, however, Eisenhower was not speaking in abstractions. There actually is a scientific elite. Jade Helm 15 is anything but the American way. It's a domestic scientific control grid whose purpose is domination and control. A technological infrastructure for authoritarian political control is not the end goal, but a means to that end of eugenics. The term eugenics, coined by Charles Darwin's half-cousin, Sir Francis Galton in 1883, is a science dedicated to the engineering of the human genome by selectively breeding those humans with what they consider to be desirable qualities, such as intelligence, athleticism, etc., and eliminating those humans without these attributes and all races of humans unlike their own. Out of this, race theory and race science was born. Carl Pearson, a protege of Galton, assembled a biometrics laboratory based out of the University of London in 1907 in order to collect data about people mostly based on race. He also published a journal entitled Biometrica, which became very influential with American scientists and financiers who were becoming extremely interested in the concept of eugenics. As this movement grew in popularity, top American industrialists threw their money into the game. Carnegie, Harriman, and Rockefeller were among the top contributors. California became the eugenics capital of the world, while on the East Coast, Cold Spring Harbor Research Facility, located on Long Island, was collecting and storing biometric information on average Americans in order to begin the elimination of families, as well as entire races of people. Through the efforts of the California eugenicist, mostly through written pamphlets and endowments mostly from the Rockefellers and Harriman, the eugenics movement found a second home in Germany in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. This pre-World War II, well-funded, international scientific community based around the eugenics movement was cementing its place as a standard in human academia when World War II broke out in full scale. The then CEO of IBM, Thomas J. Watson, worked hand in hand with Nazi Germany. In 1933, it was Watson who enthusiastically helped the Nazi plan and funded their national census, which according to historian Edwin Black in his 2001 publication, IBM and the Holocaust, the 1933 census with design help and tabulation services provided by IBM through its German subsidiary, proved to be pivotal to the Nazis 
in their efforts to identify, isolate, and ultimately destroy the country's Jewish, Gypsy, and other minority communities as well as single out political opposition. While much of the world was forever altered by the events of the war, this eugenics-based community remained together. A similar and frighteningly more advanced version of this eugenics-based biometrics program is being tested right now under the name Jade Helm 15. While the term eugenics is no longer used in the mainstream openly, the practice of eugenics is still around and stronger than ever. Jade Helm 15 exercises the next generation of technology in the political domination arena. It is simply another technological step beyond the Cold Springs Harbor Research Facilities Biometrics Program or Thomas J. Watson's Census of Germany and their disciplines developed during the eugenics heyday in the early 20th century are still being practiced and advanced today. Mandatory toxic vaccines, abortion, family courts, contaminated water, and of course biometrics are just a few of the branches that grew out of the original eugenics trunk, still present and dominating over our society today. In 2010, the GeoInt Symposium, an annual geointelligence, geospatial, an activity-based intelligence conference held a presentation entitled Mastering the Human Domain. Geospatial intelligence and human geography were the main talking points. Jade Helm is born and begins to take form. The human domain encompasses the totality of the physical, cultural, and social environments that influence human behavior, explained Admiral McRaven Success in this domain won't be achieved by traditional ground, naval, or air forces. Instead, success in the human domain will depend upon understanding the human terrain and establishing trust with those individuals who occupy that space. The goal is to see if groups of these special forces can move around the civilian population without being noticed, you know, blend in so they can place themselves in strategic positions. McRaven continued by saying, Building understanding of the human domain requires boots on the ground, feeding information into the network. A living active map where human beings are movable real-time landmarks and everyone's personal thoughts, feelings, medical information, belief systems, history, basically every shred of information about the individuals in any region on that map will make up the terrain. When mastering the human domain, the special operators are the masters. They are the key that turns this whole machine on. And regardless of whether the military calls this project activity-based intelligence, ABI, geospatial intelligence, coupled with human domain analytics, what we are looking at is a nexus between private tech firms, homeland security and law enforcement, domestic surveillance, and the domestic use of special forces. How is any of this legal? How is any of this not a violation of the Fourth Amendment? A tech startup, Recorded Future, that uses a system of filtering through and classifying open source data, demonstrated their predictive analytics capability during the 2012 GeoInt conference. Trajectory Magazine reports, the concept is to find people who are talking about the future. Vice President for Recorded Future, Matt Kodima says, we can basically roll back the clock. We know that this particular did happen in this time at this place. Now let's go back a week before that and look at the publications. Who was predicting that accurately? Who wasn't? Add this layer of predictive analytics on top of the other human domain analytic and you begin to get an idea of the scope and range of the overarching inescapable control grid these scientific controllers are constructing. At the same GeoInt conference in 2012, Jeff Jonas, the chief scientist for IBM Entity Analytics and an IBM fellow, talked about the potential for open source data utilization. He said, in typical IBM tradition, space, time, travel data is the ultimate biometric. It seems that IBM and the scientific elite's perspective shifted from the master race to mastering the human domain. So we probably won't see doors kicked in and military trucks shipping political opponents to their demise during this summer's Jade Helm 15 military procedure. However, 
As Brzezinski states in Between Two Ages, the technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Just like Watson's census was not the end sought by the Nazis, neither is Jade Helm 15 an end, but a means to a historically predictable end. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. I just want to reiterate something that was very important. Near the end of the report, we had Jeff Jonas, chief scientist for the IBM Entity Analytics and an IBM fellow. What he said was, space-time travel data is the ultimate biometric. And of course, that's your metadata. That's what they've been telling us. Don't worry, we're not recording your phone calls and all your conversations. We're just getting some metadata. It's nothing any, not any big deal. No, it is your biometric data. It is very personal. That activity-based intelligence is one of the key features that they're going to use to track you. It's one of the key enabling technologies. And we need to also understand the predictive nature of this and how dangerous that is. Remember, Nixon had his enemies list. That was considered to be pretty sinister at the time, and it was. The potential for abuse of that, and we did see abuse with that on a very small, limited scale, the potential for abuse with this now is for everyone in the country, not just for a few journalists or political leaders that are enemies of the president. It's for everyone. And are you an enemy or not? They're going to be doing this with predictive analysis. They're going to be profiling you personally by the uh, things that you put on social media, by the groups and the people that you see. That is incredibly dangerous because that's the kind of profiling we saw in the massive purges of Joseph Stalin. Just rounding people up and killing them because they might be a potential threat at some point in time. And understand that all of these are connected. It is not the military doing something completely compartmentalized over here, law enforcement doing something over here, federal government doing something. They're all interconnected. Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, FBI, the Pentagon, and especially special forces. They are the tip of the spear on collecting biometric data. Well, that's our news for tonight. If you're watching